Welcome back, Everyday Americans. You rejoin the Constitution study. And today we're looking for justice in our justice system. Uh, as I promised, I have a guest with me today. I have Lieutenant Joe Pagano, a uh, fellow, uh, I'm sorry, Pang Pangaro. I always get that wrong. Everybody uh, does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, a fellow America Out Louder. And uh, I want to talk to him. First, I want to thank you for joining us here on the Constitution study. But uh, I also wanted to talk to you specifically. He wrote an, uh, an, an interesting piece on the uh, Crumbly case and the conviction. So, Joe, welcome to the Constitution Study. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate being here. Glad you could join me. So, uh, again, I'm the Constitution guy. So when I first saw this case, uh, my first reaction is, wait a second, why are we punishing the parents for the act of the child? And then I got a little more deeper into what was going on and I guess part of it is maybe you can explain to the audience that may not be that familiar the a little bit about the case, but also about this question of um, was it vicarious guilt? Yep, sure. Uh, several years ago at the Oxford High School in Michigan, a uh, 16 year old kid, Ethan Crumbly, was having some type of difficulties in school and he had made some disturbing comments to his parents and maybe to the school people and they called a meeting between the mother and father, James and Jennifer Crumley, and the school officials with the young man uh, there. He came to the meeting. They had a discussion. The school said, based on some very, very detailed and scary drawings he was making, uh, that they felt he may be a threat, and they asked the parents to take him home. Well, for whatever reason, the parents couldn't take him home that day. They had work or whatever, and they had to go back. And the school decided to let the boys stay in school that day. Well, the parents left, and a short time later, the kid had a gun in his backpack. He produced that gun, and he killed four people, four other students uh, in the school and injured, injured many others. He was arrested. Uh, he was captured alive, which is unusual for active shooters. He was captured alive, and he was tried. But the interesting part of this and why I wrote about it is the parents were also charged. For the first time, the parents, James and Jennifer Crumbly, were charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter uh, because of the actions of their son. And that is what I found because it's new. It's a new paradigm of charging parents for the actions of their child that I think is something we all need to look at because it has it has wide ranging implications for all of us, for every person that has a child, a grandchild, a guardian of young people. If somebody under 18 does something now, have we now opened that door that you may be charged? You know, you should have known or you did know that they were involved in things they shouldn't have been and somebody gets hurt or killed, as in this case. Is that something that's now going to come back to you? Is vicarious liability going to go from a, a concept and a use in civil matters uh, to now criminal? So if you know that your kid is having a problem and they do something, can you be locked up and tried? Well, these people were convicted, uh, two separate juries, two trials. Uh, Jennifer and James were tried separately, and they were both convicted, and they were both sentenced beyond the maximum. So the maximum was 8 to 10 years, and they got 10 to 15 because of the egregious nature of the attack. And the point I was trying to make and to, to discuss was that where where's this going to lead to? It could lead to things that, that no one's intending. We're all upset and angry about these shootings that we feel helpless. We can't do anything about them. But now we're going to charge the parents. And that's that's really where where it can, came from. Yeah, you know, several points in there that, that really caught my attention. Um, you're the person with the law enforcement background. Um, as I understand it, involuntary manslaughter means that you – through your actions, although unintentionally, you caused the death of another human being. Is that a fair summary? That's that's pretty close. You, you, things that you did or didn't do, should have known or whatever, um, it, is in you didn't plan to kill somebody, but your actions ended up someone died. Right, and, and that, that's my understanding of manslaughter and involuntary. It, it, it's it's the same type of thing you would have if somebody were driving recklessly and got into an accident and and killed somebody, same type of thing, if I would understand it correctly. Well, I, I think if we break it down, you have homicide or murder. You know, right. homicide is the intentional killing of another human. Murder 
is the specific targeting of an individual and taking their life. You know, you plan to go kill them. Manslaughter is when you conduct yourself in such a way that someone can end up dead. So in your case, right. you're talking about vehicular manslaughter. Mm -hmm. If I'm drunk and I'm driving around and I kill a family of five, I should have known I shouldn't have been driving. And I have absolute responsibility for that. Involuntary is the next step down where I had no idea that by working on my car in the street up on a jack, that it could slide off the jack and run over and hit kids playing baseball. Right. I, I should have known that. I didn't intend to do it. I didn't purposely do anything, but my actions led to that. So the the conviction says that the parents, because of their actions with their child, it led to the death of other people, even though that was not their intent. That's that's correct. And, okay. and what, what the court was looking at there was that this boy was troubled. Uh, and all of this came out in trial. Now, I, I didn't I wasn't there in Michigan for the trial. I'm just going by the news uh, reports. And that's where I gathered the info is that the parents, the boy apparently expressed to his parents that he was having uh, problems, mental problems. He wanted to see help. He wanted to get medication. And the parents basically said, you know, no, we're not doing that. Grow up, get over it, that kind of thing. And his actions then led to him attacking classmates, killing four innocent young people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what shocked the conscience of the community. And, and the reason that I think it's so different that it's never been done before is because it is that feeling of helplessness. What what can we do? We can't stop these things for lots of reasons. I, I teach and train about active shooter response. It's just that the next one can pop up at any time. And why can't we stop them? Well, there's lots of reasons we can't stop them. We're not stopping them. We're not doing the right things. We're not taking the right investments. But in this case, the prosecutor said, and I think hobbling together that whole vicarious liability, charging them because of what they knew or should have known could have been deadly or dangerous is where they came up with this. And they got a conviction now, whether or not it'll stand on, uh, on appeal, that's mm -hmm. another thing. And we'll have to see as that comes down the road. Yeah. Cause it, again, it brings up the, like you said, you know, uh, from my understanding, you know, emotions make bad law and you see something and you want to punish somebody. And we've all met that. We've all seen that parent, that isn't parenting, you know, the kid's running crazy and he's bothering other people. And, and, you know, we wish the parent would do something, but they refuse here. It's taken to, well, that lack of involvement, that lack of responsibility um, led to the death of innocent people. Uh, that's why I said, when I first read it, I'm like, why are the parents being charged? But as you see, the, the, the parents are, are not being charged. I guess it, in in my head, the way I said, it, it's it's the fact that they didn't do something it, it for their child. They right. saw a problem. They didn't do it the same way as if you know you were on your property and you had a a, a dangerous tree or you had some situation that was obviously dangerous and you refused to deal with it. And if somebody came to visit your house and was killed by whatever this was, that's the same scenario. But you're right. This could easily be. Um, expanded into other situations. If a um, if a parent of a minor um, that minor is out, you know, has a driver's license, is out with a car, and is driving recklessly or gets intoxicated or whatever, can the parents be held responsible? Where's that? The, apparently, there's no bright dividing line that says here is the limit of your vicarious liability. In these situations, we have as parents, we have responsibility for our children. As they grow older, they take on more and more of that responsibility. Where's that? Like, I guess that's what you're saying is there's no line yet as to where that goes. Right. And when somebody opens a door like these prosecutors did in, in Michigan and say, we're going to charge this now, now is where you say, well, we can all understand. And I'm not opposed to it. If there are a specific law that is created that outlines your responsibility for your child's actions. If you have no idea about what your child is doing, I, I don't know how you could be held responsible for that. But if you do know, like in this case, the, the kid expressed violence apparently, and he needed some help and the parents didn't do anything. So I see where the prosecutor went with this. But what about if you have a child who's a member of a street gang, a 13, 14, 15 year old kid, and you know they're a member of the street gang, 
and that street gang engages in criminal activity and crimes and use of weapons, and then that child is involved in a shooting, can you be held responsible? You knew the kid was part of the gang. You didn't call the police to come and search their room and take their weapons. You didn't report when they were hanging out with the gang. Are you then responsible up that chain for that person who was shot in the street? And that's the kind of thing that's unintended consequences. You know, the law of unintended consequences is what this is, because you can certainly see that in a community where maybe they are more strict about things, they may say, yes, absolutely, you have liability for that. You have liability for everything your kid does, whether you know or don't know. And that opens a, a whole nother uh, can of worms, because how do you how do you then determine what's good parenting and what's bad parenting? There are people out there that have children that they can't, the, the parents can't even take care of themselves, let alone take care of young people that are running around. Do we penalize that then? Do we decide who should or shouldn't have children then? You see, I mean, it sounds far afield, but that's how these things gain a life of their own and move on. There, there's unintended consequences and questions that we must ask. Well, it's the, the problem from the constitutional point of view is legislation by, by the courts rather than via a, a, a true legislative deliberative process. Uh, I, I think I, I agree with you in that uh, in this particular case, I do see the the link for the vicarious liability. The parents were aware of problems, did nothing about it. Um, and that there's a causal nexus between that and, and the deaths. But if it's simply because a lawyer came up with this idea and was able to, and was able to convince a couple of judges that this is the, the situation because there's no legislative or deliberative process. You're right. There are no boundaries here. And it, it's one of the biggest problems I see in our so-called justice system is more often than not, what we're dealing with is the emotional unique situation that sets the standard. You know, this yeah. was, this was a unique situation. It was highly emotionally charged. This is seen by going beyond the recommended sentencing um, and that could easily now become the standard because all it takes is another is another uh, uh, attorney to say, well, listen, this court said that there was a vicarious liability and that they could go beyond that. Why would it not apply here? Correct. It, it, it's it, you're right. It's, it's a, it is something to keep an eye on. Very slippery slope and uh, certainly something, uh, at least now that I'm aware of it, I want to keep more eye on it simply because it could spin up into who knows what. Right. And, and your point, and that's exactly one of the things that I was saying. If there's a specific law that is laid out that everyone can understand that these are the parameters for which there will be criminal uh, liability for your for your inactions or actions. OK, I'm, I'm OK with it because then it's a case by case charging decision. So they could investigate and find out that the family really had no idea. They, you know, the kid got the gun, stole it from another friend, bought it from a kid on the street. I investigated a homicide, uh, young people, 17 year olds, where a 17 year old killed his mother and he had purchased a handgun from two other young men, friends of his, who got it from a person who was involved in drugs and they bought a gun and they sold it to this kid and he killed his mother all the way up the chain. Where's that liability? Mm -hmm. Did, you know, they sold a gun illegally. They possessed, excuse me, possessed it illegally. Should they be charged? And that's where that deliberative process you're talking about is what's needed. And, and I think on appeal, I think this might have a hard time um, unless, again, it's emotionally charged at the appeal level. Uh, but you hope that, you know, cooler heads prevail and they look through this and not to let not to take responsibility away from those who should be held accountable for anything that, that happens in our society but that we look at it clearly, calmly, with a cool head, and ensure that justice is at the uh, at the root of everything we decide to do. Yeah, I I, I agree. It was it was like I said, it was an interesting case. I thought it'd be interesting to to talk to you, and I hope my audience understands. You know, our initial reactions may be one thing, but when you look at the details, and I always say details matter. When you look at the details, you say, okay, yeah, there are things to still be aware of, but um, we need to be, we need to not be that emotional knee jerk reaction. We need to be thoughtful about it and consider the unintended consequences. What happens next? Uh, Joe, thanks for coming. Where can my audience find out more about uh, the work that you're doing? 
Okay, so I uh, on the America Out Loud dot news network, I have a show at one o'clock every weekday. It's called Chasing Justice, where we talk about all things about justice, uh, justice in life. We talk about uh, politics. We talk about traditions. We talk about things about the human condition and and things that are out there. And then, as you can see, I'm in my podcast studio. We have a, a law enforcement based podcast. Uh, that I run. It's called the uh, Blue Heart Podcast with Lieutenant Joe. Uh, we can You can find me uh, audio version at jpangaro.podbean.com and all the shows are on there. And then if you want to see me, you can go and uh, you can go to YouTube and go to Joseph at Blue Heart Webcast and all of our shows will pop up there and you can see I'm in the studio and I have guests and I, I talk about law enforcement based things. So it's it's been great to be here with you, Paul. I really appreciate you having me on. And this is an interesting topic. Yeah, yes, it is. So before we wrap up the segment, any last words for my audience? Uh, yes. And I, I'm going to jump off of what you said there about knee-jerk reaction. This is the important thing for all of us to understand. That there's a lot going on in our country today. Uh, there are things going on that doesn't seem don't seem to make sense, that don't seem to be fair, don't seem to be just. And kind of like the frog sitting in the in the in the pot of water as it starts to heat up if we don't open our eyes look around and start to ask is this truly right is this just and is this going to make for a better society or do we just feel good about doing something uh, and that's not necessarily going to lead us to the right place so i would say pay attention learn listen to paul's show and uh understand your rights the constitution should be the guide for everything that's a great thank you joe it's been great talking to you hopefully we'll you speak too. again in the near future you bet 